I'm Reverend G, um, minister at the Unitarian Universalist Community Church on Shaver Road is our, in Portage on Shaver Road is our physical location. And I am so absolutely delighted that you chose to spend this time with us on this beautiful morning. In case you're wondering why am I laying down, there is a reason for that. I have sprouted a CSF or as it is also known, cranial spinal fluid leak. And um, until I get surgery, I can not really be upright, either sitting or standing or walking. So this is it me, but I'm mentally all there. Well, as there as I've ever been. Um, so re-welcome again, I'm Reverend G. And um, why don't we start with lighting the chalice, which is what all Unitarian Universalists do this morning, wherever they gather, um, to live in community, to share values, to share inspiration. Um, so I will hand it over to Freya to light the chalice. Well, that could have gone better had we had sound, but the chalice is lit. And what Freya said, I'm sure that in the light of truth, we gather to seek, to sustain and share. So today is a very special day. I have been wishing my life away now here for a while, um, knowing that November 15 will come and Daniel Neymar will be our guest speaker and guest musician. Um, those of us who attend this community, we're quite familiar with Daniel's music because um, Nick, our uh, music director, loves his music and he plays it all the time. And I also love him and his music. I met him a few years ago and um, um, I, I, I've mentioned this before that if I ever need a, a real pick me up, um, I, I turn to his music. Um, he's inspired me more than once. Um, once when I met him in person, um, he was at a conference and I was at a particular low point in my life. And um, he helped me through that. I'm still grateful for it. He probably will never know how much he meant to me then. So anyway, Daniel um, lives in California, um, has a wife, a son and a brand new puppy. Um, he's that kind of a guy who will give a puppy a good home and, uh, no, parents, we'll you know, yeah. go for it, go for it. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> and, uh, um, apparently he also has a very serious six, six pack and, uh, why state the obvious, but he does look like Brad Pitt. Thank you. Yes. You're welcome, Daniel. Yeah, it's a burden I have to care, carry. Yeah. Yes. 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 I'm sure you have to give lots of autographs. Yeah. Um, so, um, his music was featured on Saturday Night Live. Um, he has 26, is it? Did you just record your 26th? 23, 23, 23 came 23rd, out. 23rd, yeah. but I know the 26th is coming. It's in there. God help me. Yes, probably is. And um, he is uh, very well known in the spiritual community as well for his uplifting and, uh, um, you know, just this guy has depth to him. Um, his message is meaningful. His music is just incredible. And I know that you will enjoy this time this morning so much. So I don't wish to take up any more of this time. I just want to give it over to you, Daniel, take it away and do your thing. And we'll see you on the other end. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much. You are, you are very kind, and I am uh, very glad that uh, we had a moment that made a difference for you. That's actually uh, kind of exactly what I want to talk about today and uh, sing you a few songs. Hello, everybody. Greetings from Orange County, California, where I once heard a DJ say the uh, 
Real estate in Southern California is free, but the weather costs a fortune. That stuck with me. Uh, so we have uh, we have similar uh, temperatures right now, but as you said, we're we're going into the 60s and 70s, and you all are uh, probably not. On the upside, you live in a natural beauty that we just don't have here. You might think of Southern California as uh, as paradise, but really it's mostly paradise for lizards, um, palm trees, and rich people with helicopters. <laughs> So anyway, so I'm very glad to be here with you today and let's uh let's get started with a little music. Well, I used to dream out loud just being human made me proud Now I throw my hands up in the air From disillusion and despair My heart has taken such abuse I've used my hurt as my excuse It's like my hope has disappeared Behind the shadow of my fear And I wonder why they say that aging thins the skin. Then I remember I am only one, but I am not alone. I don't need to do everything, everything, no. I can write one wrong, I can sing one song. I don't need to do everything. It's time to dive back in, yeah. It's time to live again. I am unjaded. What if you have to fall to grow? I've fallen hard enough to know. So what if life's not fair? Does it mean that I'm too cool to care? And I wonder when I stopped believing right will win. Then I remember I am only one, but I am not alone. I don't need to do everything, everything, no. I can write one wrong, I can sing one song. I don't need to do everything, it's time to die back in, yeah. It's time to live again unjaded. What kind of life would I live with my heart closed? What kind of man would I be? What kind of world will I be creating if I can love with all of me? If I just love with all of me. I am only one, but I am not alone. I don't need to do everything on my own. I can write one wrong, I can sing one song. I don't need to do everything. I am only one, but I am not alone. I don't need to do everything, everything, no. I can write one wrong or sing one song. I don't need to do everything. It's time to dive back in. Yeah. It's time to dive back in. Oh, it's time to live again. I am unjaded. There was a, a piano in a living room in 1951 on a side street 
on the north side of Chicago. There was a piano there. And that piano in that uh, little house was uh, the reason why I can now sing you this song. This is my last song. If this is my final day, if tomorrow I'll be gone, what do I want to say? If this is my last song, if it's my time to go, when my body's moved on. What will I have to show? Oh, but fortune and fame, they scatter to the wind. The things that make a name just don't matter in the end. But is the world a little more peaceful? Oceans and skies a little more blue Is humankind a little bit wiser About the good that we can do? Does the sun shine a little bit brighter Where before there was only rain? If so, then I'm glad I came If these are my last words for all of the earth to hear, if all that I have ever been was about to disappear, if these are my last words, there's nothing that I need to say. I have only tried to serve It's never been about talking anyway So much hurt there is to heal It's hard to understand All I can hope to feel Is that I am doing what I can Is the world a little more peaceful? Oceans and skies a little more blue? Is humankind a little bit wiser about the good that we can do? Does the sun shine a little bit brighter where before there was only rain? If so, then I'm glad I came. Now have I given hope to the hopeless? Has a hungry soul been fed? Now has a child stood a little bit taller because of something that I said? Now have I left a little kindness? Have I eased a little pain? If so, then I'm glad I came For that, I'm so glad I came If this is my last song What do I leave behind? What do I pass on? If I am out of time. I think I'm tentatively calling my little conversation with you today, so how big do you want to be? <laughs> how big do you want to be? That's where I'm going today. Let me explain. 
my uh, grandparents emigrated to uh, Chicago. My my uh, mom's parents, my Bubby and Zadie, they they had uh, survived the Holocaust um, almost accidentally. They had not, not actually accidentally as much as luckily. Let's say the 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 day before they were in a small they were in a small town. By the way, somebody somebody has their um, somebody has their uh, thing unmuted, so um, you wouldn't be the first person to burp without realizing that the entire world was listening. I'm just giving you a heads up. <laughs> anyway, um, so my my uh, my grandparents lived in a in a small town in Poland near the border of Russia, in uh, before the before the war, a Jewish family in a in a, a Jewish uh, little pocket of the town, and um, they had heard stories and rumors of what the Nazi army was doing as it as it was uh, sweeping across Poland, and they knew they did not have much time to make a decision. And my my Bubby and Zadie, husband and wife, in their early twenties and one brother of each of them, so four of them, decided that they did not want to stick around to see what was going to happen and how true the stories were. So they crossed over the border into Russia. They told the Russian uh, border guard that they were going to a wedding of a friend in Russia. Crossed over the border and uh, never saw anyone in their family ever again. Their, uh, the next day, the next day, the Nazi army arrived in their town and um, killed everyone in their uh, family. Uh, parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, cousins, nieces, nephews. Um, they didn't know that that had happened, however, because they were, um, once the Nazi army arrived and, and fully had conquered uh, uh, Poland, Russia uh, conscripted the two men into the Russian army, which they refused to join, um, you know, they wanted to get back into Poland. And instead of sending them back over the border, which of course wouldn't have worked anyway, they were sent to a work camp in Siberia, where they then spent the war in the kind of hardship uh, that's hard to imagine. In fact, as far as I know, they never even talked about uh, the rest of their lives. So uh, at the end of the war, they, uh, endeavored to go back to their town in Poland and were unable to return uh, because their neighbors had taken their homes um, and their businesses and their money and um, everything they owned. So they were not actually welcome back in their town uh, and had to sneak themselves into the safest place in Europe for Jewish refugees, uh, which was uh, West Berlin. So they, they, they arrived at American occupied West Berlin uh, where they then lived for several years, you know, eking out barely uh, a, a life there, where my uncle was born. Actually, my mom had been born on the way down from Siberia. Uh, apparently, supposedly, her mom went into labor with her on the back of a donkey, uh, as the story goes anyway, in Uzbekistan. And she was born somewhere up there. I don't know. Uh, and uh, then my uncle was born in West Berlin. Uh, they had uh, very distant relatives who had emigrated to the United States uh, decades earlier, who lived on the north side of Chicago. And after the war and the Holocaust, the uh, names of surviving Jewish people of Europe were published in America for people who were praying that their families or their relatives had survived the concentration camps. And these, these distant relatives spotted uh, Rivka and Getzel, or Rebecca and Gilbert Luden, in the, in the names of survivors and their, two, and, uh, and their spouses, and uh, sponsored them to come to Chicago. And my mom still remembers the uh, boat ride across the ocean and how much people were throwing up, how, how rocky the, the, the ride was. The, uh, and uh, she still remembers seeing the Statue of Liberty off in the distance when they arrived in New York. Uh, she still remembers Grand Central Station. She was a little girl. She still remembers getting on the train to Chicago in this strange new world that had welcomed them um, as refugees. They arrived in Chicago and this family, uh, my uncle tells me that they sponsored, to his knowledge, over a hundred people to emigrate to the United States from uh, post 
Holocaust, post-World War II Europe, and where they, they hosted people in their living rooms on the floors. They co-signed um, a, a apartment leases. They co-owned businesses until people could get on their feet, these people who they brought over from Europe. In the living room of their house was an upright piano. And my Bubby and Zadie, f fresh off the boat, literally, from Europe, uh, new arrivals to the United States with nothing but the clothes on their back, uh, saw that there was an upright piano, and they thought to themselves, and used to later say, we figured, I guess a good American family has a piano in the living room. And when they were able to um, rent and then own the house across the street from that family, uh, with the help of that family, um, my mom says that before they put furniture in their home, they put an inexpensive used upright piano in the living room. That piano, um, 30 years later, 40 years later, um, their grandson, Danny, used to play little recitals for them as he was learning how to play piano, taking lessons as a little boy. And my Bubby especially would just beam with pride and hinge on every note, you know. time and that was one of them one of the songs so fast forward another 40 years and their grandson Danny my grandparents now of course long gone um, uh, their grandson Danny now sings songs on a piano uh, and uh, I do that uh, in honor of them even though I sometimes forget that I'm doing an honor of them. In other words, I'm a, I'm a professional singer-songwriter living in Southern California. I mean, given the six-pack and the, you know, uncanny resemblance to Brad Pitt, you would figure, yeah, this guy's a big movie star, <laughs> movie star or clearly a rock star, which, of course, never happened. Um, instead, what happened is I arrived in uh, California and started singing songs for humanity, songs about making the world a better place. And to be honest, that was an unconscious... There was an unconscious guidance there. Um, this is not to sound noble because I would have gladly written a really, really cranky, codependent, miserable, obsessive um, love song that made me a million dollars. I have a little boy upstairs and he's expensive and only getting more expensive. And it would be nice to have a college fund. Um, and maybe I will one day. Um, but in the meantime, I have been doing this certain kind of music that is um, about kindness and connection and compassion. And only very, very slowly has, have I really gotten some context and some understanding of the fact that I, I don't sing only for myself, right? That there, there are, uh, there's a family behind me, chronologically behind me, and in some sense standing behind me, I think, and, and and rooting me on, uh, that I'll never meet. There are names that I'll never know. Uh, there's a language that'll never be spoken again. They, they, uh, they only spoke Yiddish. And uh, for some reason, none of the name odd boys, I have two brothers, none of us were taught Yiddish. Uh, so it's a language that's more or less going away as well. Um, there was a songwriter in my family, somewhere back there, and I don't know who it was, uh, but they passed along the ability to me. Um, and so I don't just write songs uh, for myself. And as much as I would like to have written one of those cranky codependent love songs, and I've written some, I've written some, and they're pretty good, uh, but it's really not where my heart and soul reside. Um, the thing that I do uh, is different than that. And it's different enough that I've never been able to explain it to anybody, really, certainly not in the music business. Um, so, uh, for example, when I, when I, uh, sat down at, uh, in my apartment in West Hollywood in uh, 1999 or 2000, 
and wrote this next song. Uh, it was an encapsulation of a feeling I'd always had, but only over the next 20 years did I really understand that what I have been attempting to do with this song, this next song, and, and last song that I just sang and others, um, is to do my small part, and it is a small part, to, to do my small part, not just to honor the family I'll never meet, but to to chip away at the separations and the divisions and the differentness and the hostilities and the fears that could cause a Holocaust to begin with. So I'm doing my very small part as I see it, as I'm capable of, um, inspired with the seed planted by that little upright piano uh, on Drake Street in, in Chicago. And it has manifested it through me as, uh, as this next song. So I moved to LA to make a living making music, to be a rock star, not really, but to do something grand. And 20 years later, I find myself asking, how big do I want to be? And maybe more importantly, why? This one power, invisible, and you see it everywhere and every day. One power, indescribable, You speak of it with every word you say. Mysterious until you know the truth. As simple as the love inside of you. Call it God, call it Spirit, call it Jesus, call it Lord. Call it Buddha, Baha'u'llah, angel's wings, or heaven's door. But whatever name you give it, it's all one power, can't you see? It's the power of the love in you and me. We speak so many languages clothing, different colors, different names, but different is only dangerous when we forget that in the heart we're all the same, and we'll remember once we close our eyes to see that such distances were never meant to be call it God call it spirit or Jesus or Lord call it Buddha Baha'u'llah Hashem or heaven's door it's Mohammed it's your mind it's your soul or it's your sign universe, it's music, Mother Earth, or Father Time, but whatever name you give it, it's all one power, can't you see? Whatever name you give it, it's the very air we breathe, it's the power of the love in you and me, one power. One power is what we are. It's the moment of creation. It's an everlasting peace. It's the freedom of forgiveness. It's the sweetness of release. It's the joy of inspiration. 
It's the sunshine on your face. It's the birthright of all nations. It's the boundlessness of space. It's the beauty of a baby. The serenity of sleep. It's the anger we abandon. For it's love that's most deep. It's one power. Oh. forever in you and me it's the power of the love in you and me I've been doing um, a series of interviews lately on uh, Facebook. I, I have traveled for a living for 20 solid years now as a performing singer-songwriter, and of course I haven't been able to do that since March. And one of the things that I thought of doing was to uh, do a series, a large series as it turned out, of Facebook shows. I never liked Facebook. I never cared about Facebook. No offense to Facebook, but I just really had no interest whatsoever uh, and didn't understand why anybody would post a picture of the pizza they were having for lunch <laughs> as if it was news. Um, but meanwhile, uh, uh, hypocrite that I am in so many ways, uh, I discovered in March that Facebook could be quite useful if I was unable to sing for people in person, that I have become able to sing for people uh, through my laptop and my phone. So that's been a wonderful thing. And so I've started doing some interview shows. One of the interviews I did hasn't aired yet, but I can share with you one story from it. Um, is a uh, a man named Ed who, uh, in addition to being actually a pretty talented singer songwriter, it's how I met him. And before that, he was an American Airlines uh, pilot for almost twenty years, which itself is pretty special and impressive. But before then, he was a lieutenant colonel in the United States Marines and served on the ground in Vietnam uh, as a platoon leader. And uh, he told a couple stories that were really extraordinary um, that really stopped me in my tracks. Uh, the first I can tell real briefly was that he was uh, finishing basic training and had always dreamed of flying jets. And this was the Vietnam War was going on, so they were training in order to go to Vietnam. And he had gotten a letter uh, from the Marines uh, admitting him to flight school to become a jet pilot that he had always dreamed of becoming. And he suddenly realized that if he took that commission and became a jet pilot, he would not be able to command troops on the ground in the jungles in Vietnam. And he had observed that good leadership could save soldiers' lives and mistaken leadership could cost soldiers' lives. And he loved and respected his fellow soldiers and realized that he had the capacity to lead. It was in him. And he agonized over the decision overnight and we didn't talk to anybody about it. This is his story. He's telling me, I'm sure he's told others too over the years, I agonized over this decision, woke up the next morning, walked into his commanding officer's office and said, I'm going to turn down flight school. I want to be infantry on the ground. And he went to Vietnam and commanded troops 
And he said, as a commanding officer, he never lost a man. And he never regretted that decision uh, because he knew that, uh, that he had been able to look after these guys. And his decision uh, had always been about getting them home safely. And sure enough, he says he did. The other story, though, that he told on the subject of how big do you want to be is a story about a village that his, uh, his platoon, the men under his command, arrived at uh, after it had been uh, destroyed. And they arrived in this village and um, they discovered two babies on the ground crying and in bad shape, and their mother was dead nearby. And these babies were alone and hurt and of course scared, and they were literally babies, couldn't roll over as much, you know, much less walk. Um, and he called in a medevac as the commanding officer, he said, which was not protocol to do. Uh, he called in a medical uh, helicopter to save those babies' lives, those two babies. And this is, this is an exceptionally kind man. This is, a, this is a man with honor and with a big heart. And in fact, I, I, when I got to know him, you know, you know, I don't know if you've ever noticed, you can tell, you can tell that somebody was, was or is a dancer from the way they stand. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. You can tell I'm not a dancer from the way I stand, but a, a ballet dancer, for example, a trained dancer, has a certain bearing, right? And so does a trained soldier have a certain bearing. He had a bearing, and I wasn't sure when I first started talking to him. I thought, oh, I'm his this this um, this spine of steel, this uh, this this integrity that I can feel, this honor that I can feel. Maybe it's from him being a pilot, because pilots feel that way too, don't they? Um, but no, it was it was his it was his command, it was his it was being a marine uh, that had, uh, and, and he he would say it that really made him the man that he became. Um, so this and this is a big-hearted man with 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 strength and with honor, um, and uh, he made sure those babies uh, were, were uh, saved, uh, went out of his way, gathered his troops around to look after those babies until, until they were able to be evacuated. Uh, and that was early in the 1970s. Now my interview with him happened uh, maybe two weeks ago, 2010, end of 2010. So we are very nearly 40 years later. Ed has never forgotten those babies. And to hear him tell it, not a day has gone by that he hasn't hoped from a very deep place that those babies grew up to be happy, healthy um, citizens of a new Vietnam. And he knows they would never know how close they were to not surviving that day. Uh, but he knows that he did what he could and he knows, by the way, that, that he accepted his commission, went to Vietnam on the ground instead of in the air, and that all may have unfolded specifically to save those two babies that day. So how big do you want to be? Do you, do you like me, sometimes want to win some big award? Do you want to win a Grammy? Do you want to win an Oscar if you're an actor? Do you, want to, do you want to write a book so you can be on Oprah? Do you want to run for office so you can be president? Or do you want to be on the school board to make the schools in your neighborhood better, right? Do you want to save everyone who is homeless from suffering? Or can you help the one person on the street corner down the block from you? We just adopted a dog, as has been mentioned, um, and that dog was most definitely uh, homeless. Uh, there's no, of course, I heard the, uh, 
I heard the adopting uh, agency that the woman who has saved thousands of dogs, somebody came up to her and asked about a different dog when we were adopting ours uh, and said, how, oh, how long ago was, was she pregnant? And the woman, Lydia, who, who uh, runs the charity said, you know what, I don't know, she hasn't told me her whole story yet about the dog. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, so we don't, of course, we cannot know what our dog has been through, but we can tell from his behavior that he, um, that he has lived uh, bite of food to bite of food, and he's skittish, and he has never felt a home. He's never felt like he's at home, I don't, I don't think. Uh, it's possible that our couch is the first couch he's ever gotten a chance to take a nap on. Uh, it's possible that uh, we're the first family he's ever had. It seems likely, to be honest. Um, and, and so we can't save every homeless dog in the world. Um, but but uh, we can make a difference for this one dog. And as my song, Last Song, that I sang for you, that poses the question, uh, really, is the world a little more peaceful, right? Has a child stood a little bit taller because of something that I said? It's not, it's not a practical, it's not a reasonable, it's not a realistic expectation to save the self-esteem of every child. But can I help a child with one comment, with one uh, little bit of help with homework, with one compliment, right? Um, with one good job. And, and how big do I want to be? Can I allow that single, simple act? Can I allow helping one living thing to survive and thrive? Can I allow that to be enough? Or does my ego tell me there's much bigger, I could do much more, right? Enough is a very elusive feeling. Um, I don't know if it's true all over the world, but it certainly is true in America. You don't hear enough about enough, sorry. You don't hear, no, you don't hear too often, I have enough money. My business is big enough. My stomach is flat enough. I have enough hair on the top of my head. My car is fast enough. I mean, you hear it, but much more often you hear, got to get more, got to do more, got to be more. I'm going to lose more weight, right? I'm going to make another million or a first million. Uh, I, I got to learn more. I got to go back, figure that out, get better at this. I got to, I got to, what I really want to, I need to, it's never, it's a never ending thing. And it's, and, and it's in some sense, the nature of nature, you know, life wants to live. Can't, we can't fault ourselves for uh, wanting to learn a little bit more math or a little more science or a little bit more about business or or get a you know a, a new desk or a new table or a new bed or a new shirt we can't we can't fault ourselves for that the question is whether those wants satisfied or unsatisfied eat away at our peace of mind and erode our sense of of goodness as people. Ed, the, the Marine, did not come home uh, and grieve for the next 40 years um, that he only helped to save two babies. It has been a, a point of pride for him for his entire life that he participated, he doesn't take sole credit, but that he participated in saving those two babies and in giving them at least the chance to recover and heal and have a life after the war. I'll share one, one more story with you and one more song if I could. Um, my uh, little boy, Jude, who I hope took the dog out to pee because he is not potty trained. <laughs> um, uh, he, Jude, is eight, and um, Jude is a Jude is a good boy. I'm not I'm not painting him as a saint. Uh, I wouldn't want to. It's you know, um, but uh, he is uh, he is a good boy, and 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 especially he is a nice boy. And he started in uh, kindergarten with a uh, with a boy in his class we'll call Evan, 
who had just arrived, also fresh off the boat, like my family did, but he arrived from Vietnam and with, with his parents and baby, baby brother, little baby brother, so cute, it, you could, it, it took restraint not to eat him. He was so cute. Both of them actually beautiful babies, but that little baby, oh, 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 pushed around in a little stroller by his parents who didn't speak a word of English. And neither did Evan when he started in kindergarten. And uh, Evan struggled in school. Most days, Jude would come home and tell us another story about how Evan got in trouble. He got in a little fight. He couldn't understand instructions, of course, so how could he follow them? Teacher was lovely. And she prepared these little, this little, you know, room full of munchkins, 28 kids, to, uh, to give Evan a little extra space and explained that he doesn't speak English, but it was, it was problematic. He really had a hard time. And, uh, and as much as a kindergartner can be a dis disciplinary problem, nobody painted him as a, as a problem child, but he was complicated to have in that classroom. And then one day our phone rang and, uh, it was Jude's teacher. And she said, I wanted to tell you uh, something that your boy uh, did today. I said, okay. Melina, my wife said, okay. And she said, first of all, I want you to know that your son is the kindest boy in our class. And of course I start crying. And my, of course, not of course, you'd have to know us, but my wife looks at me and says, oh geez, you're not gonna start crying, are you? Which is a pretty good <laughs> summary of our relationship. <laughs> It's good. We balance each other out kind of nicely. Uh, so I start crying and I say, yeah, that's, that's wonderful to hear. She said, he's always looking out for kids. He finds the color crayon they can't find. He points out where the water fountain is if they can't find it. He's just, he's just encouraging. He's just, he's just a pleasure to have. She said, but today he did something I wanted to tell you about. Uh, I, I finished reading a book to the whole class, 28 kids on the rug in the, in the middle of the classroom. And your son raised his hand and I said, yes, Jude. And Jude said, I think Evan did such a good job listening today that he should get an extra point. Now I have the two grandparents I told you about. And of course I have two other grandparents. Um, one of them is my father's mother. My father's mother was the youngest of 13 kids. All 13 of them and their parents, my great-grandparents, my dad's grandparents, emigrated at the turn of the 20th century, right around 1900. A family of 15 emigrated from Poland, penniless, not speaking any English. My Bubby was a real character, my dad's mom. She lived to be 98 years old. She was about as wide as she was tall. She never did a day's exercise in her life. But she was tough as nails, always up for a joke, hard, hard working. She worked in the Sears Tower in downtown Chicago for almost 30 years without a high school degree. She had had to quit school in grammar school to help support her parents and her brothers and sisters. She then stood out on the street corner to catch the bus to downtown Chicago from a tough neighborhood where she worked on the third floor of the Sears Tower, never went above the third floor because she was afraid of heights, I swear to God. That company kept her on all those years to do office work, uh, deliver mail, find supplies. My little bubby toughed it out. And uh, she was always, the, they, at her retirement party, her coworkers said she was always the first to get there in the morning and the last to leave at night. Um, standing out in the snow. You guys know what it's like to stand out in the cold and the snow in the winter to catch a bus. Um, and she did it, right, to support her family. And um, my dad had a younger brother, Jack, who um, died in the Navy in his early 20s. I never met him. My older brother, Jack, is named after him. My dad, uh, through the power of his uh, um, smarts, uh, got himself a, a scholarship to the University of Chicago and then got himself a scholarship to Harvard Law School and then became a law professor and spent the next 45 years as a constitutional law professor and advocate for our civil rights. That is how he dedicated his career uh, and, and has become and still is a nationally renowned expert in our civil rights. You read stories about police brutality, 
You read stories about flag burning. You read stories about freedom of the press or freedom of assembly. That's actually my dad's specific area. And it's a, it's a plug, but it's only if you feel like it. I just posted uh, the first interview I did was, uh, and, and released was an interview with my dad. Uh, and it's worth, it's worth seeing. If you go to my Facebook page, which is just Daniel Amod USA, uh, watch the watch the video interviewing my dad. Not about me, um, uh, but it's a really interesting story, and uh, and it's a very I learned things about my dad and about the law that I didn't know all these years. So this little bubby, the youngest of thirteen, she arrived and started school in kindergarten, not speaking a word of English. On her deathbed. 90 plus years later, and I know because I visited her on her deathbed, we were still talking about one of her proudest achievements in her life, which was that in second grade, she won the spelling bee. She started school not speaking English three years earlier, two years earlier, and in second grade, won the spelling bee as the best speller in her class. It was a point of pride for her. Uh, she had to quit school soon after that, but she was no dummy. Um, and uh, and as soon as the uh, Jude's teacher told told us that he had spoken up for Evan, who didn't speak a word of English, um, my mind immediately made the connection to Jude's great grandmother. And I, I told my boy, I said, "Your great grandmother started school in kindergarten." not speaking a word of English. And by second grade, she was the best speller in the class. I said, Evan might be the best speller in the class. He might be the funniest kid in the class. He might go on to cure a disease. He might be a famous actor or artist. He might start a huge company. He might turn out to be your best friend for life. There's no way of knowing because right now, only right now he can't speak your language so you don't know him yet. He might be the nicest kid in the class. You'll find out, I said, but here's what I know. Between kindergarten and second grade, your great-grandmother went from not speaking English to becoming the best speller. There's no way she did it alone. And most likely it wasn't her parents. Her parents didn't speak English and they had 12 other kids. Somebody spoke up for little Betty back then. Somebody stepped in, noticed that she had capacity to learn and took a little extra time or said an extra kind word to her and made a difference for her. And you just did that for Evan. You spoke up and that might have been the first time since he arrived in the United States that everyone in the room looked at him and smiled, that the teacher had nothing to correct, that there was no frustration, no exhaustion, no instructions he couldn't understand. It was a moment of real acceptance and kindness and you gave that to him. And he probably didn't even understand what you said about him. And it didn't matter because he felt it. And you probably will not know the difference that that makes. But I promise you, I said to Jude, you made a difference for his life today and I'm proud of you for it. So back to the subject of the day, how big do you want to be? How big do I want to be? Is it enough to make one person's day better? Is it enough to do that if no one notices? Is it enough if there's no credit, no honor? How about, how about no thanks? We all want to make the world a better place. Everybody does. We all have different feelings about what a better place looks like, <laughs> for better or worse, but, but we all want to make the world a better place. What I'm suggesting 
is that to aspire to make the whole world a better place is not just unrealistic, but also a recipe for dissatisfaction and frustration and self-criticism. And uh, one of my favorite quotes comes to mind, no one, sorry, it's a, it's a male he in the phrase, but I'll, I want to quote it accurately anyway. Uh, no one ever made a bigger mistake than he who could, than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. No one ever made a bigger mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. If you are like me, you're sitting on your couch or in your car, reading the newspaper or online, watching shows, talking to people, putting on a mask to go into a grocery store, voting, all these things, and you are feeling a division and an acrimony and an exclusion and a hostility and a fear and an uncertainty that's really unlike any that any of us have ever experienced. I mean, we can point to 2008 with the financial crash. We can point certainly to 2001 with the September 11th attacks. Uh, we could point to when the hostages were taken in Iran. We could point, of course, to World War II. We can point to the time to Vietnam and when uh, John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and Dr. King were killed. We can point to certain moments where the upheaval must have been almost overwhelming. Here we all are and no one is immune. Sorry for the pun. No one is immune from this uncertainty and this fear and the division you know, I sometimes tell Jude, most of the time when someone is angry, it's because they're scared. It's a, it's a realization I'd had when we were talking and I, when I had made somebody mad on the road because I'd accidentally kind of cut them off, almost cut them off. And I, it's because I didn't see them and they honked their head off at me and made quite a face as they drove by. And Jude said, why is he so mad? And I said, because I scared him. And I realized Almost always, we're looking at scared when we think we're looking at angry, just beneath the surface. We're not that far from hyenas and leopards and, you know, monkeys. And we have spines, and those spines react faster than our wizened emotions as humans. We don't analyze it. We feel it. And, it, and the feeling of, of fear frequently comes out as anger. And boy, are we seeing a lot of anger right now and a lot of separation. So if it's any comfort at all, and I wouldn't presume that it is, if it's any comfort at all, no one watching, no one out in the world, no one, not the head of the UN, not, the, not a police chief, not a janitor, not a little independent singer-songwriter, not a famous, rich, rich uh, world-renowned one, no one can heal the world of that fear and that anger. But each of us can, in fact, make a significant important imprint and difference right where we are. The only question is whether we can allow ourselves to do that and let it be enough. About six months after we got that phone call from Jude's teacher, uh, I found myself writing a song about it, which I didn't expect to do. And I'll leave you with this. Lately I've been thinking about what motivates me To give a couple dollars to a stranger on the street To hold the door, carry groceries, help a neighbor in need When history repeats itself in headlines every day Solutions never big enough for problems that we face. As a man, as a dad, what difference can I make? Cause I know better than to think I'll be remembered for a favor or a quarter or a smile. Oh, but maybe before I return to sender, 
I can do one thing worthwhile. So I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to raise a kind child. Sure would help if our boy went and got an MBA And took care of his artist mom and dad in their old age But let's face it, Wall Street probably isn't in his DNA But when his first grade teacher said she wanted us to know it's Jude who always comforts every kid who sits alone. There's just so much pride my heart can take. My retirement can wait. Cause I know better than to think I'll be remembered for a fortune or a pension or a prize. Oh, but maybe before I return to sender, I'll have done one thing worthwhile. So I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to raise a kind child. I don't want him to think the world is his to save. It's too much pressure anyway, it can't be done. I don't want him to think he has to be a saint, cause the truth is saints don't have any fun. Mostly I just hope, my boy, you'll come to understand. No 401k or GPA, can make a happy man. It's having roots, doing good, helping out where you can. So put down roots, do some good, take somebody's hand. And you'll know better than most what really matters. What makes living this life worthwhile? And there may come a day your own kids will remember how their granddad used to say with a smile that he raised. We raised a kind child. today. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday afternoon and a beautiful week ahead. I, I don't know how you follow this um, with other than thank you. You're uh, I for one am inspired I'm touched and just contemplative quiet. So thank you, Daniel. And thank you all for joining us. Um, here I am with tears in my eyes and I'm, I'm assuming that so are you. And um, join us after we are done with the service. Join us in our Zoom group and spend some more time with Daniel. Um, I, for one, am very much looking forward to it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending this time with us. And uh, hope to see you again. And now we will have Freya extinguish the chalice. Please say these words with me as we extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame 
but not the warmth of love nor the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. You can't be kind enough. You can't be compassionate enough. But you are enough. So go live your life and make a difference in every way you know how to. And so it is. Thank you for joining us. I'm Reverend G, Minister at the Unitarian Universalist Community Church. And our special guest today was Daniel Neyman. See you next week. Bye now.